Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to our uh, dialogue series. This is our sixth session. Uh, um, we, this is, um, as you know, we have uh, an ongoing dialogue series entitled uh, Specters of Crisis, Rays of Hope, um, organized by uh, the Agrarian South Network, uh, the Sam Moyo Africa Institute for Agrarian Studies in Zimbabwe, uh, and ActionAid India um, in New Delhi. Uh, this uh, dialogue series um, is um, an attempt to come to terms as best we can with the challenges that have been presented uh, by the COVID pandemic and the ensuing social and economic crises. We are very pleased and honored to have with us today, Professor Jayati Ghosh, who will be speaking on the, the possibilities for progressive fiscal strategies in the COVID-19 world. Uh, we also have with us, um, as discussed, Professor Issa Shiji, and I will be presenting both uh, shortly. Uh, as you might know, our supporting partners, this is a, a, an initiative which has involved many institutions around the world. Uh, our supporting partners include uh, the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU, uh, um, in India, the Aid for African Studies at the University of Ghana, the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong, China, um, the Postgraduate Program in World Political Economy at the University at the Federal University of ABC in Sao Paulo, and also uh, the Educational Technologies and Languages Unit at the same university, who is also the unit which is also taking care of our translations, which appear um, in the videos that we released. Uh, release uh, shortly after the, the, the sessions. Uh, we are translating, uh, including inserting subtitles in Portuguese and Spanish in all our sessions. Uh, the dialogue today will be in English as we, as, as we have, have been, uh, but you may send your questions in um, other languages and uh, within our abilities, we'll be translating these questions and uh, channeling them to uh, Professor Jayati Ghosh um, uh, th uh, through our team that is, uh, our logistics team that is involved in this. You may send your questions uh, on Zoom and Facebook. Um, you can write them, yeah, and we will uh, forward them. Um, so without further ado, we, let me uh, present Professor Jayati Ghosh uh, Jayati Ghosh is a renowned development economist and professor of economics at the uh, Economic Studies and Planning uh, Center at, at JNU in New Delhi. She's also executive secretary of IDEAS, which is International Development Economics Associates, a network of heterodox economists. She also serves on the board of directors of, international, of the International Association for Feminist Economics and has been working with several international agencies like the ILO over the years, the UNCTAD, uh, UNDP, and others. She has published widely uh, in her core areas of research, which include international economics, macroeconomic policy, um, employment policy, uh, gender issues, development issues generally. Some of her books um, uh, over the last 10 years um, uh, after the crisis, adjustment, recovery, and fragility in East Asia, which was recently republished, and this was done with uh, Professor Chandra Shikhar in 2009, Interp interpreting the world to change it. Essays in honor of Prabhupada Naik, again with uh, Professor Chandra Shikhar in 2018, the Elgar Handbook of Alternative Theories of Economic Development in 2018 with Professors Reinhardt and, and Cato, uh, demonetization, decoded with uh, Prabhat Padnaik and uh, uh, C.P. Shandrasekhar, Women, Gender, and Work, uh, Social Choices and Inequalities, another co-edited volume in 2016, Never Done and Poorly Paid, Women and Work in Globalizing India. This was in 2009. So over the years, and I won't go uh, beyond the last decade, then we will spend our whole time doing this. <laughs> and we will not uh, uh, hear her presentation. So Professor Goss is also the recipient of numerous awards and prizes, including the UNDP Award for Excellence in Analysis in 2005, the ILO Decent Work Research Prize in 2010, and the Malcolm 
Adi Shishaya Award for Contributions to Social Sciences in 2015. Um, our discussant, you have already seen on our dialogue series, is Professor Issa Shivji. Uh, professor Shivji is Emeritus Professor at the University of Dar es Salaam. He uh, was the first to be appointed to the Mualim Julius Nyerere Chair in Pan-African Studies at the University of Dar es Salaam. He's an eminent scholar of law and development issues and also published very widely uh, over the years. I uh, will just limit uh, to two or three titles. Uh, uh, Where is Uhuru? Reflections on the Struggle for uh, Democracy in Africa, Pan-Africanism or Pragmatism, on the Lessons of uh, uh, the Tanganyika Zanzibar Union, Development, most recently, Development is Rebellion, biography of Julius Nyerere with Saida Yahya Otman in Gwaza Kamata. Uh, we did the launch on this book uh, just the last month on, here in this series. Uh, Issa Shish is also editor uh, of Agrarian South and a member uh, of the a key member of the coordinating team of the Agrarian South Network. Welcome to you both. Um, it's an honor to have you here with us. Um, the, the topic, as I mentioned, is on the possibilities of fiscal, progressive fiscal strategies in this um, new situation of ours. So without further ado, I will pass on uh, the platform to uh, Professor Jayati Gosh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paris, for that really warm and uh, very effusive introduction, which I don't deserve. But I have to say I'm really honored to be here with all of you in this series, which is already an excellent series. So it's a privilege to be part of it and to meet some friends virtually, if not in real life, and hoping that at some point we can all meet again face to face. I would like to dedicate this lecture to Sam Moyo because, you know, I mean, I think for all of us, the very little time that passes without us thinking of him. But especially in this period, I have been really missing him because I know that Sam would have found something new, innovative, iconoclastic, uh, sharp to say about this new situation. He would have brought a new perspective and a new angle. I think all of us are really missing this. Uh, so this one's for you, Sam. Okay, I'm going to actually- you know, today, uh, it's his today, Jaya, today it's his yes. birthday. Oh no, really? Oh yes, my God, a, you are yes, going to make yes, me yes, weep. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God. <laughs> here, Sam, it's not a good enough birthday yes. present, uh, but here, yeah, okay, wow. That, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> right, well, yes, definitely this uh, to the memory of Sam. Yeah, and uh, may many, many more like him emerge uh, on days like yes. this. Yes, yeah. indeed. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen now. Oh, and... Um, Basically, I will, uh, I hope the full screen, yes, here we are, the full screen. Okay, so as uh, Paris already mentioned, and uh, I also forgot to mention that it's such a privilege to have Isa Shivji as a discussant. Uh, Isa is somebody whom we've been learning from for decades, and it, it's such a privilege to be able to inter interact uh, intellectually, even virtually in this way. So, What's the context for why we need uh, progressive strategies? I think, first of all, we have to realize that uh, globally, capitalism is in terrible shape. I mean, it's been in bad shape for a while, but it could disguise it. It's been in bad shape ever since the great financial crisis, uh, which was met with absolutely the wrong policy responses, even from capitalism's own perspective. I think I want to keep emphasizing this that this is a system that has been shooting itself in the foot for a while now. And uh, what we have today is, if you like, uh, the pandemic has brought out, it's like an X-ray. It is showing you the skeletons of a system in which all the bones have eviscerated and where it's really no longer feasible, but it's bringing out the problems that already existed in global capitalism. We all know those. The uh, the massive inequalities, the erosion of public health systems, including in public health, uh, uh, including in health, especially, which is why everyone was so ill-equipped to handle the pandemic uh, and many, many other issues. Uh, but what it has meant is that a health issue could actually cause the entire global econ economy and the global system 
to actually collapse. And that's quite significant. That, that tells you how fragile, how vulnerable the entire system was. So what do we have today? We have a global economy that is going to contract by the most optimistic measures are 4%. This is the UN's latest estimate as published in the Trade and Development Report just yesterday. Uh, a minimum of 4% contraction and probably much more. Trade will shrink by around one fifth, FDI down to almost half of its level last year. Remittances, which are a lifeblood for many developing countries will be down by at least 100 billion as well. Now, these are all conservative estimates coming from the UN system. Between 90 and 100 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty. When we talk about extreme poverty, we are talking about those who do not have enough money to buy food sufficient for survival. Um, a minimum of 90 million and probably much more. At least 300 million people facing food insecurity, and we know that many of these are in India, but also in many other developing countries in Africa, in parts of developing Asia and elsewhere. What's worth noting is that you know, these are just the, the estimates of GDP, and GDP is a very uh, inadequate measure. We know that the employment collapse is much worse than the GDP collapse. It's much greater already than uh, GDP collapses in most countries. In the countries where it hasn't fallen as much, it has been artificially sustained by special measures, fiscal and others, just designed to keep people afloat. But the collapse in livelihoods and employments is uh, very, very sharp. Uh, economists are very fond of approaching the alphabet to talk about the nature of the recovery. And of course, uh, many of the more optimistic variety, they always talk about a V-shaped recovery, okay, that it's going to fall because of the illness and pandemic and lockdown, and then it'll come back to where it was. That's completely unrealistic. It's unlikely within countries and globally. There are those who've said, okay, it will be you, that is, we'll have a fairly long depression, and then we'll rise up again. There are others who say, no, it'll be uneven. It'll be like a W. We go up and down. And then with the second wave of illnesses as occurring in many countries, of course, in India, we're still on the first wave. But in many countries, there's a second wave. Then it will be a W. The more pessimistic suggest L, which is that it goes down and it stays down for a while. Okay, And that is, of course, possible and likely. But uh, if we're going by the alphabet, then what is happening right now is a K shape which is to say massively increasing inequality. Some people doing very, very well indeed. Some people and some companies, digital companies and the extreme rich have doubled their income in the last five months and their asset values doubled. So that Amazon, which was already this enormous behemoth has doubled its uh, market capitalization in the last five months. Mr. Jeff Bezos has more than doubled his personal wealth and his income from that wealth in these five months. Uh, there are other extreme examples in the developing world. In India, we have Mr. Ambani, uh, who is a, a telecom giant who has also massively increased his wealth. Whereas most of the world, 99.9% .9 is actually on the way down in terms of both income and assets. And so this disparity, which was already obscene before the pandemic, we had globally obscene disparity that has now grown very, very significantly. So it's a disparity growing in terms of the K-shape between developed and developing, between rich and poor within countries and so on. It's very clear that there's only one way, even within the current framework of capitalism for it to recover. And that is major bold public spending. But very few developing countries are able to do this. A bunch of developed countries have actually put in fairly large stimulus measures, which have had limited but positive impact. But uh, the, the developing countries on the whole, as you can see from this, as you go down to the more developing countries, it gets smaller and smaller. Even these numbers are an exaggeration, I have to tell you. These numbers are taken from the latest trade and development report of UNCTAD, and they have gone by government's own announcements which are way in excess of what they have actually spent. Just to give you an example, India, which is somewhere you know, over here in the screen, I don't know if uh, I, I'm able to point at it with the arrow, but you will see that it's down here and it's supposedly a 10% of GDP fiscal stimulus, which is what Mr. Modi declared in uh, April. Actually, it isn't. The fiscal stimulus, uh, the 
increased spending of the government since April, that is April to July, the four months between April and to July, the increased additional spending of the government is less than half a percentage point of GDP. So the fiscal stimulus is non-existent, less than half of a percentage point instead of 10%, uh, so 1 20th of what was offered. This is true for a bunch of other developing countries as well, which they have, where they have exaggerated. South Africa is a case in point as well. Not as severe, the actual increased spending is more like 3.5%, not, but it's still significantly less than what they claimed, which was 6%. But advanced countries have actually gone out there and put money out there very, very significantly. Japan, uh, very large, uh, 17 to 18%. But a bunch of others have also actually had very, very large fiscal stimuli. Uh, developing countries on the whole have not, even though it's very clear that when all other agents are unable to spend, it's really only governments that have to and must spend. Why aren't they? Well, there's a concern about debt levels. And here's the problem. You see, the global economy was already going into a wall of debt before the pandemic struck. Uh, Estimates are for global debt stocks, uh, record level, 258 trillion. Uh, I, I mean, I'm very bad at the number of zeros, but it goes on for a very, very long time, right? Lots and lots of zeros in this. It's a huge number. It's more than three times global GDP. In fact, what happened is that during the first few months of the pandemic until about June, the global debt to GDP ratio has now increased even further because of the fact that some governments have actually increased their spending and a bunch of other corporates and others have been unable to pay their debt. So that's been added on to their existing debt. So the global debt to GDP ratio now is 331% of GDP, very, very large, historically unprecedented. What does that mean? It means that certainly we're going to have waves of corporate default and this will put additional pressure on balance sheets, but the overall debt dynamics is not dominated by these private failures. It will be dominated by the governments, by the sovereigns, because of these spillover effects of global financial stability. And it's really that concern which is holding back a bunch of governments, including in the developing South. The, but the, the thing is that, you know, it's not debt per se, which is the problem. You can manage debt. The issue is how are you going to manage it and sustain it? You can take on debt. Governments can take on debt if it is spent in ways that will cause economic activity to rise. And that is really the issue. The problem is that currently the policies are wrongly directed. Once again, just as they did after the global financial crisis, they are focusing on regenerating asset bubbles, short-term managing of investor expectations, boosting asset prices. What does that do? It gives you a speculative bubble and that gives you the mirage of recovery. Instead of looking at increasing aggreg aggregate demand and therefore generating a vigorous recovery of productive investment and employment, you're basically trying to create the illusion of recovery by uh, creating you know, stock market bubbles and then saying, well, now investor sentiments are up and therefore they will invest and so on. And, and it, in addition, what are they doing? They're using monetary easing, which was already incredibly loose and even looser credit policies to try and revive economies. Again, these do not work if demand does not recover. Okay, so the critical thing is to revive demand. Unfortunately, governments are fearing that they are taking on too much debt and that is holding back public spending even when it's most needed. But right now you can actually manage sustained fiscal expansions. You can manage them, certainly in developed countries because the interest rates are low, zero, sometimes even negative, and in some larger developing economies. And you can do this without an inflationary impact and in a way that becomes self-financing if you generate more growth. I'll come back to that point. But obviously this spending has to be oriented to productive investment. And ideally in new green technologies, the pandemic should not allow us to forget the bigger existential threat to humanity, which is already there in the form of climate change and which many regions across the world are already facing and the significance of universal good quality public services, which will necessarily require more spending. Now, the point is that this fear of debt, you can see the difference here between developed and developing. The yellow bars are the fiscal and the average 
uh, fiscal uh, spending in the developed world is much, much more than in the developing world. Remember that in the developing countries, this is a very overinflated figure. In fact, the actual fiscal spending has been much lower, uh, certainly for the countries for which we have the, the more recent data. Uh, but it's been dominated also, even in the developed countries, by all these loans and loan guarantees and credit subsidies or extension of credit, uh, which, as I said, doesn't work in a situation where aggregate demand is low and where that's not enough to generate bullish investor expectations. If we do not do something, then there's a real fear of a lost decade. And this is not just me. It's not just some crazy economist from JNU who's saying this. This is the United Nations has said, warned exactly this. As I mentioned in the latest trade and development report, there is a, a, a very strong point being made that if fiscal austerity becomes the default mindset, you're going to have another lost decade globally and especially in developing countries. And uh, we all know what lost decades do. They disproportionately hurt the poor. They disproportionately attack the social and economic rights of ordinary people. Now, what's happening? In many developing countries, there's an urgent need to improve health spending. So they're trying. They're trying to improve health spending. Uh, the trouble is that then they say, oh, but we don't have the money, so let's cut down on other things. So first, they don't spend enough on health, and then they try and cut down on other forms of spending so as to ensure that you know, they don't have a large fiscal deficit and they don't have more debt. Why? Because as the economies collapse with these lockdowns, with the disease itself and so on, tax revenues fall. And in addition, you have a collapse in export earnings, you have pending debt payments. So many developing countries are worried about the balance of payments as well. And so they are holding back. They're not spending as much as they must if the economies have to recover. Even economies without these constraints, like India, the governments are imposing, the self-imposing austerity in the midst of a pandemic. I told you already how the Indian government has spent less than half a percentage point of GDP in the months between April and July uh, on additional spending, because a little bit of increase in health spending has been countered by decline mining spending on a bunch of other areas. Even though in India, we don't have a very large debt to GDP ratio, we don't have an external constraint at the moment. In fact, because the economy has collapsed so much, India has a current account surplus. Nonetheless, the government is imposing austerity. Now, what does this do? This actually generates a really vicious cycle of low employment generation, wages, aggregate wage stagnation, economic activity slows down, and that means less tax revenues, and that means more pressure on government budgets. I want to, again, come back to the point, uh, which is being underplayed, I think, in a lot of the discussion, of a looming food and hunger crisis. In many countries like India, it's already evident, and it's a collapse of purchasing power to buy food. It is not aggregate supply of food. India has got surplus food at the moment. It's just not being distributed to the hungry. Uh, but in a bunch of other countries, there are also supply concerns in addition to the distribution concerns. So clearly, we need lots more spending, and that spending has to be broad-based. Immediately, we have to put money in the hands of the, who, those who will spend it. So focus on the poor, focus on uh, wage employment schemes, focus on income transfers to the poor, not just for welfare and equity, uh, but also as compensation for denying them livelihoods during a lockdown. And also for macroeconomic reasons, for the fact that you have to revive demand, as I have said. Employment revival is absolutely crucial. And so I think most governments, especially in the developing South, must focus on public employment schemes and special packages for micro, small and medium enterprises, which are the biggest employers globally. Uh, I have alluded to the food crisis that is linked to an agriculture crisis. And you know, everywhere there is a sense that agriculture is somehow less effective because you can do it with social distancing, you don't have to worry about things that happen in cities and so on. That's not true. There's serious agricultural crisis in many parts of the world, certainly in South Asia, but also in large parts of Africa and Latin America. And that has to do with the other concomitant crisis that we're facing of climate change. We know that there have been various pest attacks like locust attacks, which are linked to climate change. We know that there is desertification 
and there's declining soil quality and reduced water access in many parts of the world, again, related to the climate threat. <coughs> All of which are re urgently require public policy attention. So it's not true that agriculture is somehow saved. It is very much affected, but it's not being sufficiently addressed. I have talked about climate change affecting agriculture, but you know, climate threats are wider and greater and deeper. There are too many of us cities are on coastlines that are under threat of inundation. Too many of our populated areas are under threat of extreme weather events like floods and earthquakes. And all of these we know are going to happen more and more. And so we need to have much more spending for mitigation. Uh, but certainly even more spending currently on adaptation, because this is already happening to us. The pandemic has exposed what should have been obvious a long time ago, the critical need for spending in care, which is not just uh, important for a, a, you know, a decently functioning society or for, to enable social reproduction, but it's now evident that you cannot have a resilient economy unless you're spending adequately on care, because your economy will collapse whenever there is, in fact, some public health crisis. So I think we have to see care work both as a necessity and an opportunity. I mean, as I mentioned, it's exposed to the critical need for care. But it's also the case that, you know, the care sector is one of those which has a huge future potential because it is not one of those that is so adversely affected by new technologies. There's this whole fear that, you know, technological change is a tsunami that is going to take away job opportunities especially in routine manufacturing and routine services, a lot of desk-based work and so on. Care work is fundamentally relational. Technologies can assist it, but you cannot do away with the human interaction. And we under provide care in all our societies, all kinds of care, child care, elderly care, therapeutic care, uh, you know, I, I, we massively under provide care. So if we actually provide decent levels of care, I estimated, for example, that if the rest of the world had the same proportion of care workers to population as Sweden, taking just two categories, child care, uh, basic health care, and elderly care, these three categories, uh, 13 workers per population in Sweden. If we just apply that model to the expected population of the world in different regions by 2025, we would get at least 230 million more jobs. And I think this is the point that, you know, care work is something which if society values, we can actually generate not just healthier and happier societies, but we can also generate much more employment. This is not going to happen through the market. It's kind of evident, right? Uh, private markets will under provide care. So they have to occur through public intervention. So we have to recognize the importance of care work invest in it and in skills and training for care, make sure health workers and all care workers are trained, that they have good wages, that they're not seen as the bottom of the bottom, and they're not treated as volunteers who don't even have to be paid the legal minimum wage. We have to make sure they have social protection and physical protection now, right now, especially we recognize the, the importance of providing physical protection to care workers who are battling a pandemic. Uh, the tech Technologies are enablers. They should not be controllers. They should not be used to monitor, survey care workers so much as to assist them. But what does that mean? It means that you have to think of care as public purpose at multiple le levels, better quality employment, improved conditions of life, and genuine productivity growth rather than the false productivity growth that comes by looking at just output per worker ratios, which is a completely false way of looking at productivity in the service sectors. So how do we finance all this? Uh, it's a big task, right? I'm saying you have to spend all this money. You have to spend it for macroeconomic reasons. You have to spend it for health reasons. You have to spend it for survival reasons, okay? Where do we get the money? Immediately, and I mean very, very immediately, you have to finance it by just borrowing from central banks. You cannot hold back saying, I have got this much money coming into my account and I will spend only this much money. That's the household level, that is not the government level. States are not constrained by what money is coming into their tax coffers. They have never been. At no point in time is state spending today in period T determined by inflows in period T or even T minus one. Okay. 
And so you just simply borrow from the central bank and spend. And advanced countries are already doing this big time. I mean, the Federal Reserve has already released, I think, the equivalent of 30%, 40% of GDP to the central, the federal and state governments in the US. And in many, many, Japan, UK, many other countries, they're just doing this in a big way. And notice, there's no inflation happening, right? So it's not true that this will automatically generate inflation. But developing countries are prevented, partly because financial markets don't like it, and then they threaten them, and you're threatened with capital flight and so on, and also partly because then policymakers fear domestic inflation and balance of payments constraint. But as I mentioned earlier, and I just want to emphasize this point because it's so important, the less you spend now, the worse your fiscal problem will become. If you spend less today, that makes the fiscal problem worse. Why? Because economic activity falls further, tax revenues fall. As a result, even with lower spending, you can end up with a larger fiscal deficit. And your fiscal deficit to GDP ratio will get worse because GDP will have fallen. So if it's counterproductive to spend less today, you have to spend more if you actually want a sustainable fiscal policy. So if you spend more now, you'll have increased economic activity and higher future revenue streams. Now, the fear is inflation, right? And I've already told you in the advanced economies, there is no inflation, despite all this massive increase in spending. But even in developing countries, what is the problem now? It is essentially a lack of demand. If there is inflation, it will be supply led in particular areas. Maybe there's a food bottleneck. Maybe there's a particular bottleneck in some sector. That will be the source of inflation. So if supply constraints are also addressed in that spending, then you are not going to get inflation by this additional spending. The problem is financial markets and capital flight. And so therefore, in the initial phase, you may well require capital controls, which even the IMF now recognizes is something you may need to do uh, because of the fact that this otherwise will prevent you from being able to have a reasonable level of uh, domestic policy space to cope with the pandemic. But of course, eventually somebody has to pay for this, right? This is the short term, this is right now. Uh, but I am not someone who is arguing that governments can just keep spending indefinitely without raising the resources. So we have to also think about feasible proposals for taxation. And I would argue that there are two areas of really low hanging fruit that governments across the world can adopt immediately to generate significant increases in tax revenues. These are proposals made by this very awkward acronym, ICRICT, the International Commission for Reform of International Corporate Taxation. Yeah, okay, so even the term is, it is a, it's a global commission of which I happen to be a member, uh, but we have made a number of proposals for national governments, which eventually will require international coordination. Okay, there's no doubt. What are these proposals? Basically, you have to apply a, a larger, uh, a higher corporate tax rate to large corporations and oligopolized sectors that have excess rates of return, which are coming up from market power, from control over many markets. I mean, the digital economies are class, the digital companies are classic examples of this, but there are other examples as well. And the idea is that what we do is treat a multinational corporation as a unit. Apple, for example, is actually one company. It's not Apple India, Apple Netherlands, Apple US, etc. It's one Apple, right? But then when they come to India, they say, oh, our profits in India are very low. All our profits are actually in Ireland because all the intellectual property is held there. So they end up paying very little taxes in India or in France or in many other countries. They go to Ireland where they can take advantage of what is called the double Dutch, where they do a little side deal with the Netherlands and they end up paying no taxes at all. Instead of this, what we're proposing is that you set a minimum corporate tax rate and we're suggesting 25% worldwide. And uh, the practice that I've just described to you, that's called base erosion and profit shifting. You reduce the base from which profits can be taxed and you shift your profits to low jurisdiction, uh, low, low tax jurisdictions, okay? What are we suggesting? We're saying, well, listen, Facebook, for example, India accounts for 12% of Facebook revenues, but apparently only 2% of its profits. Okay, so we say, well, listen, hey, Facebook, the Indian government says, uh, we are going to tax you on the basis that 12% of your 
profit or by of your users or some other you know basically the formula we're proposing is a combination of either sales or users users because in digital companies uh, using it generates the profits right it's not sales uh, and employment so a formula based on sales and employment will determine your share of the taxable profits and then you say if your global profits are 10 billion and my share is 10% i'm going to tax you at 25% on that 10% okay it's actually quite a, a simple point and it's not something incredible and complicated in the united states state uh, uh, which has a federal tax system this is how it works there every state has the power to tax but they use this system of unitary taxation so the state of oregon will say my share of the sales of this company is this much so i'm going to tax at this rate that's how it works in the us we're suggesting the global equivalent of this which would actually reduce all the incentives for base erosion and profit shifting the oecd had started work on this and it was uh, part way through it was a limited offer and not good enough it's been blocked by the us at the moment but this is in fact ideally a win-win situation for all governments and citizens everywhere because it just means that a multinational corporation will be taxed at the same rate as a local corporation you're not asking anything different you're simply saying just because you're a multinational doesn't mean you should get away with lower tax you should pay the same tax as every other company so that's one and of course associated with this would be a digital service tax on the economic rents captured by multinational firms i told you how there's a k-shaped recovery it's really the digital firms that have been making hay and have really uh, raked it in in this period okay it's not just e-commerce it's an, the entire range of big digital companies that have uh, reaped massive profits over this period and are managing to avoid it but we feel that not only should they be paying at least as much as everybody else but because they are getting monopoly rents they should be taxed on those rents as well now all of this of course requires ideally country by country reporting for all the corporations which they don't like to do but the pandemic is a good time to demand that if you're going to get state support you have to give country by country reporting otherwise we don't give you any of the bailouts that all these companies are currently benefiting from the second big area is a uh, wealth tax which is really understated and underemployed in most countries in fact it, uh, many countries used to have wealth taxes in the past and did away with them now i think one problem with wealth taxes in the past is that they uh, extended to even the moderately wealthy it makes much more sense to tax the extreme wealth the 0.1% not even the 1% just tax the 0.1% because now it's so unequal that even that will generate a lot of income in india for example there's an estimate done by s subramanian that if you tax just 965 families this is pre pandemic okay this estimate was done in march just 965 families in india if you tax them at 4% of their wealth you get 1% of gdp which is double our health spending we could double the health spending of the government and state governments a public health spending we could double just by taxing less than 1000 families and you know with that level of wealth they wouldn't even notice that 4% falling off uh, their wealth amount okay since then the wealth of those 965 families has gone up by 50 to 80% so imagine how much we could get of course Of course, the difficulty here is that people then move their wealth out to all these tax havens, which are not just these funny islands, ah, huh? Panama and Caymans and so on. Uh, the state of Delaware is a tax haven. A bunch of other states in the U.S. are tax havens. The islands of Guernsey, Guernsey and Jersey in the U.K. in the United Kingdom, they are tax havens. Okay. If you publish the data on offshore wealth, then you can actually have everybody can uh, adopt effective progressive wealth taxes and global pressure can make this happen it's already happening in switzerland you can actually do this a sufficient global pressure can generate much less ability of people the extreme wealth wealthy to move their money around and benefit from this kind of evade tax avoidance measures okay so what am i finally saying i'm saying that we need a new deal okay uh, and remember what the original new deal in 
the United States was about, the FDR New Deal. It was based on these three R's, recovery, which was based on significantly increased public spending. The, glo the federal budget doubled in three years, entirely doubled in three years. That's the kind of spending that happened in the New Deal, okay? Uh, so big increases in public expenditure as part of a recovery process. And of course, how you spend that uh, money matters. I've already talked about the ways. Regulation. Uh, we forget that the New Deal was not just about more spending. It was also about regulating markets, regulating labor markets, ensuring minimum wages, allowing trade unions and associations, regulating capital markets, not allowing major financial flows in and out, uh, and so on, regulating uh, banking behavior regulating environmental conditions. A lot of regulation came with the New Deal. And of course, redistribution, a very major element. Uh, huge uh, allocations to more deprived areas and regions and people, okay? So the New Deal has to be based on these three R's, but also, you know, there's a lot of talk about a Green New Deal, but it has to be multicolored, I feel. It has to be green, of course, okay, uh, the environment, but also blue because we forget water. The really important role played by water and uh, water pollution, water shortages, you know, all of these issues. So we have to recognize, respect and preserve the environment, including water, address climate challenges. And that means also changing patterns of production and consumption accordingly. So using regulation to change those patterns of production and consumption. It has to be purple. Why purple? Because purple has been seen increasingly as the color of care. Okay. And that really means that a lot of the spending has to be directed to the care economy and through rewarding paid work through increased public spending, recognizing, reducing and redistributing unpaid care work and allowing care workers to be represented, to have a voice. Okay. That's very important. And these are also major elements of gender equality, as everybody knows. And it has to be red, okay? Red because uh, it has to address inequalities. Inequalities of assets, of income, of access to food, of essential public services, uh, education, health, employment opportunities. And of course, these inequalities now we recognize have to be reduced across different dimensions. But not just class, of course class, but also gender, race, ethnicity, caste, location, age. I think we forget how much this uh, pandemic has released major intergenerational inequities. We are creating not just a lost decade, but maybe a lost generation of the youth, which is completely unacceptable. So finally, of course, the, the New Deal must also be global. You can't do, you can do some of this on your own, but you can't do all of it. You need an appropriate international architecture, which means what? Finance and capital flows have to be more controlled. We need revised rules for trade and intellectual property rights that prevent concentration and monopoly rent seeking, and that actually encourage good quality employment generation. I don't know how many of you have ever read the Uruguay Round Agreement of the GATT, the one that let loose the WTO and all of those other agreements. That says that the purpose of this agreement is to, in, to reduce concentration, to encourage good quality employment generation, believe it or not. Okay, so let's hold them to their word on this. Tax cooperation, I've already talked about. Debt relief, I mean, you know, the current measures are completely inadequate and all you're doing is generating the conditions for a completely unpayable debt six months to a year down the line. So we really need much, much, much more substantive uh, debt relief. We should immediately ensure a big issuance of special drawing rights. These are the liquidity created by the IMF uh, by at least one trillion. Uh, people have said that one trillion is not going to be enough, but let's begin with one trillion. In fact, even the IMF had asked for 500 billion uh, more SDR allocation. Amazingly, it was rejected by the United States and India. The United States rejection is not amazing. It's expected because the United States controls the dollars and wants everybody to rely only on dollars. And it would like everyone to rely on US Fed dollar swaps. So it's not surprising that the, uh, the United States rejected it. The surprise is that India rejected the IMF proposal as well. For what reason, it's still not made clear. Uh, but talk about shooting yourself in the foot. 
for some bizarre notion of getting at your neighbors or something. Uh, it's an extraordinary rejection, but we hope that even that can be overcome. There's a strong case, and this is something that the UN uh, UNCTAD has also asked for, is a Marshall Plan for Health Recovery, financed through development assistance, international tax reform, and multilateral financing. In other words, we need a Marshall Plan for revival, but particularly it has to be a health recovery. This must ensure, for example, a universally available free vaccine when those are finally uh, done, dramatic improvements in health infrastructure in the countries where it is inadequate, and significant measures to put in place greater health resilience among the people, okay? We know that the financial system is broken globally, and a lot of that is based on the fact that the credit rating agencies also suck. So we need a, a, an international public credit rating agency, which will be much more uh, viable and trustable and not subject to the same kinds of conflict of interest that many of the private ones are, all of the private ones are, and a global debt authority to ensure that developing countries don't get trapped into these debt agreements that are deeply, deeply problematic for them. We need a peace clause in the WTO to enable countries to have the policy space to actually deal with the pandemic in ways that they find appropriate and to enable employment generation. And we need a standstill on all ISDS, investor state dispute settlement. Even now as we speak, countries that are undertaking special measures are facing lawsuits, are facing action because of investor state dispute settlement under various bilateral or plurilateral agreements. We must have a standstill on all of those to enable countries to actually recover from this particular situation. Now, all of these are actually not as revolutionary and crazy as they sound. These are now things that are essential even for capitalism to survive. Because let's face it, capitalism is not going to survive this particular thing, because maybe humanity won't survive either. But what I'm saying is that these are not even asking for a fundamental rehaul of the system. These are all reforming the existing system. Obviously, I don't believe that only reform is the way to go, but it's a beginning. And we cannot move to a newer, better system if we don't first deal with the major, major flaws and cracks in this one. So these are proposals that are actually feasible if political will can be found. Now, that's a big ask. We know that political will is, is in the opposite direction at the moment. Uh, but I firmly do believe that humanity steps back from the brink. And right now, we're very close to the brink. Okay, thanks for listening for all this time. And uh, I think I'm done. We can go on to questions. Yes, yes I got to thank you so much for this illuminating, brilliant uh, uh, picture that you have drawn. Uh, it's uh, broad and, uh, and uh, goes into depth uh, at the same time on a, ma on a number of issues. Um, I have so many questions, and uh, <laughs> uh, but I will... I will refrain as the, uh, I will at the end uh, also yeah. mm -hmm. pose one or another, but uh, I will um, uh, just uh, quickly pass on uh, the, uh, the platform to um, Isa, mm -hmm. who will also have a few words for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then we will, we will open it to quest questions and answers. There are already questions mm -hmm. coming in and we are putting it all together and we will pose them as a, 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 in the following uh, session. Uh, section of, of this, yeah. this session. So, Isa, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, Jati. After that splendid lecture, I don't know what I'm expected to say. <laughs> uh, it, it was a great lecture, and as usual, I, I, I find myself always agreeing with most of the things that Jati said. The only useful thing I can do perhaps is uh, sum up in my own words uh, JRT's alternative proposals as a kind of uh, 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 summing up of, of alternative proposals. And I think <clears throat> she, 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 she talks about product investment for various reasons she has given. And I see product investment as resolving into two major areas. Uh, social reproduction, 
and material production. As hitherto, the traditional economics considered social reproduction as not productive investment. But as an important point that Jait is making, I think we need to underscore time and again, and history is, is proving us right, that social investment, social reproduction is productive investment. I think the economy of South Korea showed us that. Okay? And social reproduction is a fairly broad category. And it includes, as Jayat has pointed out, an important sector of healthcare. And healthcare in a very inclusive fashion. Mother, child, elderly, and so on. And I think the importance of healthcare is now brought to us by this pandemic. Absolutely central to our existence. Okay. And for the first time, those whom we thought were sort of peripheral workers, early central workers, healthcare workers, and their essential role in our society has been brought forth dramatically in this. Second, of course, education, all types of education, whether the adult education, skill education, or literacy, and so on. The third is sanitation, and the fourth is water, safe water, the blue thing that you talked about. So these all the sectors and much more for the social reproduction. And that is where public spending and investment is required. And private capital will not spend in social reproduction, except for the bare minimum, for the, for the, for the worker to get up in the morning and come to work. Okay. And that is not adequate, absolutely not adequate. Second, in terms of production, material production. And here, again, Jared has emphasized, we need to have public spending investment in small producers in agriculture, with emphasis on food production. And that is extremely important, particularly for countries of the South, and I would say much more for the continent of Africa. The peasant sector is one sector, and in terms of present in Africa, you are talking about the woman. Okay? Has been totally neglected. It is the one which is used to siphon of surplus, but nothing is put, put back in, in that sector. So there we require massive public spending and investment. And as I said, with emphasis on food. And concomitant, concomitant with that and related to it. Okay, small enterprises small-scale enterprises controlled by cooperatives, okay, relative agriculture processing, and, 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 and so on. And of course, irrigation. I don't know about the rest of the countries, but I think many African countries, Tanzania would be a typical example. Irrigation is absolutely neglected. So our, our, our agriculture is very much rain-fed agriculture in the four seasons. But irrigation has not been developed. For the last 50 years, I don't know if you're more than 200, 2,000 acres of irrigation. Okay, so that is absolutely important. It's not that we don't have water resources; we do have water resources, but we don't use it for irrigation. And another, instead of these mega hydroelectric projects, which consume a lot of resources, and we do not go down the line of 20 to five years, what will be the effect of it on the ecology? Why can't we think of small hydroelectric projects? which village communities collectively can control. And we have water resources, water resources for them. And as I said, multifunctional cooperatives, two forms of cooperatives, which will go beyond marketing, consumer, and, 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 and inputs. I think Jared is rightly emphasized that for this type of alternative or alternative fiscal policies to work, the state needs to play a central role. You cannot leave it to private capital. So public spending, first and foremost, important. Public investment, that as she has pointed out. And she's also given us the sources from where the state can get money. Through taxation in Africa, with many research endowed countries, whether it is petrol, oil, or minerals, we can, we can mop up the rent, the rent that the monopoly corporations Okay, and, and, and for example, just the just, uh, uh, gold industry in, in Tanzania, those multinationals make enormous amount of money, but they don't, they don't show it. Then this needs to be mopped up by the state 
and I think it will provide enough resources for all the public spending that we are talking about. I think Jared has given a brilliant example of India, and I think that would apply to many countries because many in African countries, for example, have these resources which are simply exploited in one direction. Very little is left for the country. Of course, all this assumes certain politics. <laughs> At the end of the day, it assumes certain politics. It's not simply a question of charting an alternative, which looks fine uh, in presentation on paper and so on, which might even be acceptable to some organizations, but what politics will make these things possible? What type of governance structures? Unfortunately, the politics is moving in exactly opposite direction. We all know it, and I did not repeat it. But it, it is moving in not only opposite direction, but in a very, very frightening, frightening direction. Okay, and I think that has to be combated at all levels. And not, and I feel that it cannot simply be combated. Not that it's not important. It can only simply be combat, combated by liberal notions of democracy and inclusiveness and so on. I think liberal democracy has showed its limits. And at the end of the day, as Sami Ramin used to say, the liberal virus is, leads to fascism. Because when liberalism fails, fascism steps in. Okay? So I think we need to pose an alternative form of democracy. Essentially democracy, particularly in our country, at the level of where people live and feed themselves, where they obtain the livelihood. And working places and residential places. That's where democracy should start. And I think that alternative must be paused. Not that it necessarily be accepted, but it will give people that there is something feasible, there's something possible to do. There are other ways of governing ourselves than the ones which are all the time being, being lectured on. With those two remarks, Paris, let me, let me close here. And I'm sure we'll have many questions and, and a lot of discussion. Once again, thank you very much, Jayati. It was wonderful to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Isa. Uh, I feel represented in your, uh, in your comments. Um, and um, the implied questions that you have uh, put uh, to Jayati, um, the, um, uh, I, I think at this point, maybe we should uh, go back to Jayati before opening up to uh, questions and answers from our audience. Uh, Jayati, is there anything in particular you would like to respond to, to, to Issa at this point? Uh, not really, because I think he's raised this very, very profound issue of the politics uh, to which, unfortunately, I don't really have an answer. But I noticed that Jomo <laughs> is among the participants, and I would love yes. to hear what he has to say. So if it's possible, it would be great to uh, get Jomo on. Yeah. Oh yes, Jomo uh, has joined us, and um, he will. Uh, we, there have been some questions that have come in. So before uh, I, I I call on Jomo, let me put some questions that um, have already come in. And as I said, I do have also a few comments and questions which I will put uh, more towards the end. So, um, as perhaps as expected, uh, some of the questions are on India. Yeah. So perhaps we can just start with that. Uh, there is um, a question uh, about, um, well, the question of politics and economics is uh, tremendous politics to economics. So, okay. Um, and uh, the specific issue there on India is the recent uh, farmers policy, which is going exactly in the opposite direction uh, of the one which you are suggesting. Yeah. So that's one. If you can just comment on, on this recent farm uh, farmers policy. There is also a question on India about um, making a policy making on the basis of uh, weak data or data which uh, is questionable. Um, we have uh, a comment from Shambhu Gatak who, who says the following, physical surveys would be less possible today because of the pandemic. So that is already, we re have to rely on tele telesurveys according to our colleague. The government is not eager to disclose or collect important data. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, due to the Anti-Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, yeah, and uh, the state repression, there's, peop there's uh, people's trust on data collecting agencies declined. Yeah, so that is, is, is put here as, as an issue to be, to be uh, taken into account. Another question is, uh, well, I think you have more or less addressed it, but maybe you can just focus on some of the implications. Uh, for India, the biggest, the four biggest indicators of uh, measuring GDP being consumption, investment, government expenditure, and exports, uh, all four indicators are falling. Yeah. So what uh, could be done, I think uh, generally you have actually answered this in, through the, 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 the New Deal and the, the various other aspects of the care economy that you have addressed, but maybe we wish to return to that. There's also a question about uh, special drawing rights. Yeah in uh, fighting uh, COVID-19. Um, could you elaborate on that uh, and how to expand special drawing rights? Um, and uh, related to that, uh, governments are already reluctant to uh, increase taxes. Uh, and if we put this all together, then the, 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 then how the, how the green, purple, and red reform could be implemented. I mean, there is, I mean, the question of politics goes, we're going back to that. There's actually real constraints, which you have, which you have uh, already uh, pointed out. There is uh, another question this time from Argentina. I'm not going Argentina. to remember all of these. I'm not going to remember so many. So let me do the Okay, so let's stop there and then I will, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So to talk about the India questions first, uh, the first one related to the farmers' bills. There's no question that these are extraordinarily regressive and anti-farmer bills. And what is surprising is that any government, regardless of its orientation and so on, any government would choose to do this now in an already faltering economy in which employment has been devastated, livelihoods have been devastated, and agriculture was the only sector that was surviving. And you want to demolish that. I mean, I don't understand what rational government would choose to do that. What is clear is that this is a bill that would benefit some important cronies of the government. It would certainly in, uh, benefit those that are interested in agribusiness. And we know that uh, the companies led by Mr. Rambani and Mr. Adani are both interested in getting into agribusiness in a much larger way. They already have a foothold, but they all they want to expand much more significantly. And so this would definitely benefit them. And to some extent, it may also benefit global multinationals seeking to enter India to the detriment of farmers, because it's a bill in which, for example, it will now be more expensive to take your produce to a government regulated market. You will have to pay a tax there, which you will not have to pay if you sell to anybody else. It's unbelievable that you can actually put a law like this. I mean, there are many, many aspects of these laws that uh, deserve discussion, but it's, it's crazy that what is presented as greater freedom and choice and et cetera for farmers is actually a means of pushing them into the hands of corporate agriculture and corporate marketing of uh, food and crops in a way that will ultimately be extremely detrimental because we know how they operate. They offer you a sweetener deal in the beginning and then in a couple of years when you're caught and you've wiped out the opposition, then the monopsonistic stuff begins and farmers are squeezed, even as consumers are squeezed at the other end. But this is writing it into, I mean, you don't even need a sweetener deal because now uh, you will have to pay a tax if you take it to a government regulated market yard, but you won't have to pay the tax if you sell directly to a company. So it's extraordinary. Uh, and there's no, re there's no reason that it has to be opposed. And I don't believe, I mean, okay, maybe I'm being hopeful because the politics in India is so depressing now that one doesn't know. I don't believe that any government could get away with this beyond a point. It may pass the law, it has passed the law already yesterday, but I don't think that it will be possible to sustain. There will be just too much opposition, I hope. The second issue is about data. Yes, this is a government that has been very against 
any objective systems of data collection. It's uh, my, one of the many tragedies has been the destruction of the data system. We, India had one of the best systems of data collection in the developing world. Uh, we actually devised methods of calculating national income in largely informal economies, of working out how to capture employment when you have lots of informal work and disparate kinds of work and so on. So it's, it's really sad that this is a government that has sought to not just suppress or manipulate, but actually to destroy the systems of data collection to the point where now you ask any question and they say, we don't have the data for it. What has happened to small industries? We don't have the data. What has happened to employment? We don't have the data. What has happened to women, uh, violence against women? We don't have the data. What has happened to the extent of deaths, the, the abnormal deaths over this period? We don't have the data. We have no data for anything. Uh, which lets the government off because then you cannot obviously monitor its pro uh, progress. But it's again, it's shooting yourself in the foot because if your instinct goes beyond remaining in power to actually governing at some point, you will need data yourself. No government can actually uh, govern <laughs> without some data, which is believable. And if you are suppressing all of that and you are suppressing uh, or manipulating in a way that will just, you know, improve your public relations and your perception management dominates over anything else you do, then you will not be able to govern at all. And I think that's what we're seeing at the moment. All you'll be able to do is lock people up and, and so on. Um, yes. The other thing that has happened is that people's trust has been eroded because the, of the misuse or abuse of whatever data has been collected. And the Citizenship Amendment Act is a classic example. People are now so worried about whether they will be classified as citizens that they will be unwilling to answer any questions. And that means that, for example, the Census of India, which was supposed to start work from January 2021, will find it very hard to get people to answer detailed questions about themselves because they will not trust a government agency and they will worry that this will actually force them into being declared non-citizen for any kind of reason. So there are all kinds of concerns uh, about this. Uh, the other question was about SDRs. So let me just quickly explain uh, to those who are not very familiar with this. Uh, the special drawing right is an instrument created by the IMF way back in 1951. It's, uh, it's a form of liquidity, but it's not money that you and I can use. It's not like you know dollars or pounds or rupees that we can hand around to each other. These are accounts uh, held by member countries in the IMF and they can draw on those to pay for their balance of payments purposes. Okay, so it's an account. It's now what does an SDR new allocation mean? There have been about three or four only in the entire period of the IMF. And the latest one was after the global crisis. I think it was in 2010. And it was a relatively small one. It was about uh, less than, uh, I forget the exact number, maybe 467 billion or something. Uh, but oh, no, even less, 267 billion. Okay, but the point is that it's costless. The IMF simply creates this liquidity and then every country gets whatever is their quota in the IMF. That quota is something that was determined earlier based on shares of global trade and so on way back. So it's a little outdated, but nonetheless, it's a distribution. Now, if you issue, a, let's say a trillion more SDRs, then every country will get more SDRs in its account according to its quota. So it's like a present every country is getting. Developing countries have smaller quotas, so they will get less. Okay, most of it will go to the developed countries, but hey, most of them don't need it. It'll just sit there. Developing countries, some of them, it will make a very, very big difference to their external reserves. Iran, for example, it will be some 30 times the, the current reserves, okay, which is why the US, one of the reasons the US opposed it. But it will actually provide them a cushion. So you're getting this money, liquidity, which has been created equitably according to this norm and developing countries can then have that as a cushion, which will provide immediate cover for a whole lot of balance of payments concerns. So the big advantage of that is that it eases the balance of payments constraint for developing countries at a time when they need it most. The usual argument against having too much SDR is that it will be inflationary. We know that that's nonsense. The global economy has seen the biggest increases in liquidity in the history of the world without inflation. 
So that's not true. Okay, and so uh, there's a very, very strong case for the quotas. The IMF itself suggested $500 billion worth of SDRs to be distributed. Uh, and it's something that can be very, very easily done. It is only the constraint. I would say it's basically the Trump administration constraint because the US uh, is what matters. India opposing it will not make much difference. And I hope India doesn't continue to oppose it. Thank you, Jayati. There's, um, uh, let me call on Jomo. There's a couple more questions that we can come back to, uh, but let me call on uh, Jomo to, to come in and uh, uh, make his uh, own uh, comment. Let me see. Jomo. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, uh, Paris, and uh, thank you also to Jyoti and to Isa. Uh, allow me to, to make uh, um, a general comment. Um, uh, firstly, I, I'm very pleased uh, that you have uh, organized this event uh, on, the on uh, Sam Moyo's anniversary. And I think that we honor him and his memory, um, particularly in these very challenging times. Um, I would also like to uh, draw attention to the international, uh, to the non-Indians uh, who, are, who, are, who are participating in today's webinar uh, about the, the trials which uh, Jayati herself is facing. Uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, you might remember that uh, she was, uh, that uh, the, the uh, police um, uh, set up some trumped up charges against her and some other activists. And uh, this follows on earlier arrests. And I think those, those threats are real and ongoing and international solidarity can make a huge difference uh, in this particular uh, matter. So I particularly um, uh, want to pay tribute to Jyoti for her participating so um, uh, so calmly without uh, any sense of uh, the tribulations which she is facing. Uh, allow me to make uh, about uh, uh, five quick comments. Uh, you know, it, in, uh, for economists, for Keynesian eco economists uh, in particular, it is often thought that in, in such a situation uh, of, uh, of, of uh, recessions, uh, especially recessions which threaten to extend and become depressions, uh, that the uh, appropriate response is for the government to become the employ employer of last resort. Uh, I would uh, suggest that perhaps uh, in the 21st century, uh, we might actually think about the government becoming a payer of last resort. And this is, I, I think, something to be, uh, to be, uh, uh, to be thought about. Uh, particularly given the large size of uh, so-called informal sectors in so many of the developing country economies. Um, uh, this is extremely important uh, because two of the largest groups uh, uh, which have been very hard hit have been precisely informal, se uh, informal sector uh, laborers who are, do not enjoy any uh, the normal types of social protections uh, which you might find in some countries. And also, I think it is very important to recognize the role of petty uh, producers and other petty businesses, many of whom have been extremely hard hit uh, by the stay in shelter lockdowns. I think it is very important to recognize uh, from Southeast Asian experience and also from the experience of Kerala state in Southwest India, that these uh, stay in shelter lockdowns were not inevitable. They were, they have become, they were necessitated by the failure of government actions, the failure to take enough early precautionary uh, actions. If you look at Vietnam, for example, uh, it was one of the first uh, countries to be hit by COVID-19 because uh, it is next to China. There were many workers, like Kerala, uh, uh, it, it had a, a, a ca cases as early as January uh, this year. Uh, yet, because of early and adequate uh, actions, we, we find that, that uh, the whole situation was sufficiently contained so as not to require uh, nationwide uh, stay-in-shelter lockdowns. Of course, in, uh, 
Paris, as you know very well, uh, in Brazil, there have been uh, a, a very weird uh, kind of challenge uh, because of people like, like uh, Bolsonaro and, 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 and uh, Trump, uh, you know, insisting that, uh, that there is a choice between economy and life um, and, and, and so on and so forth. This, of course, is a false choice, but it's very important that we change uh, this discourse. Um, in this a very exceptional situation, although I've had more concerns about things like uh, universal basic income and about, uh, con about cash transfers, I do think that uh, this is a situation, uh, an extraordinary situation, where cash transfers will be extremely important, particularly to the poor, uh, the most vulnerable who have been adversely affected, in order to, to, to ensure there's sufficient uh, liquidity to ensure that there is sufficient effective demand, particularly for, by the poorer sectors of society. Um, moving on very quickly, I think uh, another important uh, uh, battle, which because most of the participants uh, are, are not involved in, in, macro, in, in, in macroeconomics, I think it's very important to, to insist in all our different societies on changing the discourse. There's often a view that, you know, you have to tax first and then you can spend. If you don't tax, then you have to, you know. In fact, the reality of the world for, for, for decades, in fact, uh, has been, is actually spend and tax. So don't, you know, it is it's very important to, to challenge uh, finance ministries and central banks um, in terms of the kind of discourse uh, which they, 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 they tend to. Now, in this connection, um, the, the one area where I felt, uh, um, you know, we, we cannot really uh, count, I mean, I, I, I very much support many of the things uh, Joyeti had to say about tax, about what is desirable. But the, 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 the urgent uh, situation right now is not to be obsessed uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the, the debt overhang which already exists but rather to, to get these economies moving. And, part, and the most effective ways of getting the economy moving is to redistribute particularly uh, to the most uh, vulnerable and to the, to the most needy. Um, another uh, issue which is particularly appropriate given that one of the uh, uh, organizers of today's event uh, is Agrarian South is that COVID-19 and the disruptions, the supply disruptions associated with COVID-19 have, have opened up a new opportunity uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the, of the 20th century, particularly from the 1980s, the old discussions of food security changed and the, 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 the mainstream uh, said, you don't really need to produce your own food as long as you earned enough by producing uh, cash crops and so on and so forth, and then you could import your, uh, your food requirements. Now, because of the vulnerability of so many economies, uh, we, we find that there is a much greater openness on this. And it's rather disappointing, particularly for, our, for those from Africa, that the, uh, the, the UN um, uh, uh, is organizing a major conference on the food on food systems which is being organized from New York not from uh, from Rome where the major international food agencies are and it's be, and the convener uh, is um, the, the the chief executive of uh, of uh, Agra the uh, agrarian, uh, African uh, green revolution now the reason I object very much is because she has taken the view that the way to go forward is to produce uh, more and more carbohydrates, and that the nutrition is not a major problem. Part of the reason why we have a lot of uh, increasing problems with malnutrition in Africa is that the move away from subsistence, where you had much more balanced diets. True, people were poor, but the diets were much more balanced when you were doing much more subsistence production. And now you have a situation where, where per perhaps there is much more carbohydrates available and, and so on. But we, we find, of course, that the whole set of micronutrient deficiencies have set in. So I think it's very important for, for, for Agrarian South and others to take, this, um, uh, to take this opportunity 
to reopen the whole discussion of, of malnutrition, particularly the problems of malnutrition in poorer, poorer countries, and, and, to, and to recognize that these, these are very, very serious problems. Um, now, uh, the two other points I'd like to make, again, I'd like to very much support uh, Joyti's uh, uh, quest, uh, points about uh, care work. Um, there is, of course, a, a great deal of concern that stay in shelter lockdowns have uh, disrupted uh, ch uh, children's, uh, um, children's uh, 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 education. And for those who depend on going to school for food, uh, for uh, breakfast programs or lunch programs, so, or whatever, uh, this has been a, 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 a huge hit. Even for an upper middle income country such as Malaysia, uh, we, we have seen very, very uh, clear effects and, and the, the, the transformation of, of, uh, of, uh, of eating patterns uh, um, with uh, increasing urbanization and so on and so forth have brought about a whole host of new problems. So we really need to get, um, we really need to get, a, 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 to try to change these discussions, to change the discussion on food security and to in, insist that it's not uh, uh, carbohydrates first, and then uh, and then uh, 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 nutri uh, balance uh, diets uh, later. Uh, the, the question of malnutrition should be seen in conjunction uh, with uh, with food security. Um, the other issue, of course, is health, and this is uh, particularly a time when healthcare financing uh, needs to be to be pushed for. Uh, precisely because of COVID-19, there is a greater sensitivity and public awareness and public support for greater healthcare financing. And we should uh, be, be struggling in our different societies for, for far, to ensure that you have uh, universal healthcare and, and that, the, that the governments are, uh, uh, do much, much more in terms of providing. And these are two areas of care work, but there are many others, of course, which uh, Joyti uh, uh, alluded to, uh, which need to be attended uh, to, uh, to be attended to. The, the last point I would like to make is uh, with regards to the uh, to uh, uh, what does it what does the, the 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 fact of the matter is that for smaller economies we have um, become uh, uh, Isa quoted. Uh, 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 Samir uh, uh, earlier, uh, we have become much more ex extroverted. You know, the eco eco small economies are all very much integrated into uh, global systems. The question is then becomes uh, how do we redefine, how do we change the terms of engagement in an international economy insofar as an international division of labor may be, may, may continue to be, to be very relevant for for, for many of us, especially for smaller economies. So uh, th this is an, a huge opportunity to, to, and I would like to uh, um, uh, encourage uh, those of you who are involved in organizing this as well as others uh, to, to push this issue. The, the, if I may just make a little footnote, Paris, because uh, many of those who are watching up, uh, in places like, like India and, in, and maybe in Brazil, um, you know, these are all economies, uh, a, a polit political, sorry, uh, a polities uh, where ethno-populism has, uh, has, uh, has become very, very important. What I call ethno-populism. Other people might have other terms for it, communalism and so on and so forth. Um, this uh, blaming of the other uh, has, uh, I, unfortunately, uh, will not necessarily end uh, with COVID-19. Uh, and this kind of uh, ethno-populist politics um, is very is 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 has become uh, uh, internationalized. It is a kind of reaction to the earlier globalization, and it's a very very dangerous and very problematic one because it is exclusive and 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 uh, it is being used for all kinds of purposes. And we are now living in a in a world situation. Uh, where we need to think very much about how we respond to, to this whole 
uh, situation and the rise uh, of uh, of ethno populism under all the different names, uh, you know, whether it's Hindutva or, 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 or you know, uh, the, the the revival of imperial nostalgia in post Brexit uh, in, in Brexit uh, Britain and so on and so forth. This is a, a force which is the in my mind as important for us to deal with as uh, as neoliberalism. Uh, especially from a political point of view. This, so I, I would just leave, uh, stop there. And thank you very much for this opportunity to, to, uh, to share some thoughts. And thank you all. Thank you, Jomo. Thank you very much for this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, broad also picture that you brought in uh, with the key points that are really uh, uh, points of contention from now, from here on out. Uh, Right. Uh, Jayati, would you like to respond in any uh, at these on any of these points? Uh, you know, I'm so happy to have uh, Jomo and Isa have comment on this because I agree with everything they've said, of course, and I think they've also brought out aspects that I didn't dwell on adequately and which I completely agree with. I mean, all of the points made, I'm in, in complete harmony with. I just want to do a couple of responses to some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, one has to do with um, the issue, I think Damien Lobos from Argentina has asked about the possibility of the development of national financial markets in local currency. I, I think that's absolutely essential. I think that's a critical part of being able to have the policy space to do some of the things that we've been talking about. And uh, partly, of course, this is driven by necessity. Argentina has been directly in the eye of the storm in terms of the, the very volatile capital flows and the ability of local elites to exploit those to actually run up unpayable debts and, and so on. Uh, I, think, I think the issue of the national finance, I mean, if you remember, Keynes said this, right? Let finance dominantly be local, primarily be local. Uh, the idea being that uh, a lot of these things are really, you don't gain very much. This whole uh, nonsense that developing countries were fed, that you have to open up your capital markets and domestic finance because otherwise you will never meet your savings investment gap and so on. That's turned out to be a chimera. The uh, capital inflows that have come in have rarely been of such a sustained manner that you can actually use them to finance domestic investment over a sufficiently long period of time. They have led to boom bust cycles that are of deep volatility and fragility. And therefore, in fact, there's a very strong case to be made for dominantly national financial markets, obviously denominated in the local currency. It is a very strong element of policy sovereignty coming from that. I, I completely support that. There are the, the several questions on the politics. I think Sudeep Shrestha has said that, you know, neoliberal governments don't want to do this. So how can we do even a wealth tax or green, purple, red reform? Nancy Kitchingwe has asked, are we seeing any coalescing of governments, especially in the South, towards a multicolor or green or anything New Deal? And the answer, of course, is no. But right now, as Jomo brought out very vividly, the politics is pretty bad, especially in a lot of their major developing countries. But you know, I think nothing is written in stone. Let me put it this way. It's a very bad point in global history. And I think it's a particularly bad point in some countries. I don't think I, I don't think in India we have seen such a bad point for maybe even centuries. Um, so yes, it's a bad situation right now. And let's not kid ourselves that it's a bad situation. But I think we also um, have to remember that what seems impossible, uh, unbelievable, and so on, are all things that have occurred because of particular balances of power and particular political economy configurations that are constantly evolving. And I'm not saying it's going to be over tomorrow, I wish it were, but it, there's no doubt that the, even this shall pass, that this phase also will end. Now, when it ends, we have to be there with ideas, or some people have to be there with ideas that can capture people's imagination. I think uh, it's going to get much more vicious as the system fails more comprehensively. And the fact that the policy responses in most countries have been so directed towards preserving a completely impossible status quo 
suggests that really, you know, the, the pressure will be on them because the status quo cannot deliver any of the things that provide social and political legitimacy over a media. ensuring control in all of the ways that we have seen and, and in many other possibly even worse ways. So it's going to be a tough battle, but it is not a battle that can ultimately be won by that side simply because these are unfeasible systems. I, had, I think again, the other thing I would like to say is that you know we don't always see change coming from the direction we're looking at it. Uh, so when you look, I mean, I, I think back to Ecuador, right? When Rafael Correa won the election, there was no political party backing him. He was just a man supported by a bunch of different parties and a bunch of social movements. Then a party had to be created. Uh, there are many other examples and instances I can say. We, we don't always see the change coming from the directions we're looking for. I think that to me is the source of hope because right now you don't see too many directions of change. You don't see so many you know, evidence of, of potential, but we know through history that they do happen. We know that they come and we know that when but in many parts of the world, uh, that eventually there is change. And uh, I think all of us who want a progressive alternative have to recognize that we have to keep that flame burning for the period when there is real progressive change. We can't simply say, oh, well, you know, all is lost and it's all forgotten and then there's no point, let's just go home and die quietly. No, because in fact, those ideas then become the seeds for some genuine progressive change. And I think therefore talking about a multicolored global New Deal is not, uh, it's not just shooting in the dark. I mean, it's dark outside for sure right now, it's dark, but it is not impossibly uh, and irretrievably over. And therefore, you know, putting those ideas out there, creating, uh, uh, creating a sense in the popular imagination that these are ways to actually get to a more desirable society. I think those are still important and essential. I uh, also would like to just comment and, and, and put a question um, uh, to you uh, about the international uh, architecture, which you have, uh, which you brought up and you have come back to, there is, um, it seems that we are indeed, even before the pandemic, we have, we, we have been for a long time uh, at the end of a policy cycle, yeah, uh, whereby interest rate policy in particular was seen as a great regulator uh, of economies. Uh, even before the pandemic, as you mentioned, a dozen countries or so were had interest rates uh, which were negative. Um, and we're talking about the big countries, in fact, we're not talking about small ones, uh, even though some small ones uh, or medium-sized countries have all, had already entered that kind of logic. Um, the question, therefore, and, and in fact, as you mentioned, uh, despite low um, and this can have a lot of uh, interpretations and you know and it has to do with the fact that jobs are also not the kind that we used to have uh, around the world um so um that's it's it, it seems like it's a, when you bring in fiscal policy as an objective the context is indeed the the, the end of a type of policy cycle which has uh, uh been attached to a type of global economy which is dominated by huge corporations uh, which also depend on, um, uh, have their own accumulation needs, which have been uh, uh, compatible with this uh, mm -hmm. a neoliberal type of management. Now, the fiscal focus uh, is uh, something that is not, um, you know, acceptable. Yeah, for, uh, you know, you said capitalism how also might have interest in this, but given the type of capitalism we have, and the type along 
uh, fiscal expansion is seen as an enemy. Yeah. Um, associated to, to this, I also, we also have a type of architecture whereby the dollar yeah, and the way that, that finance circulates through, through Wall Street uh, in a, on a dollarized economy, uh, the dollar is also has reached its limits. And as uh, you know, China has been drawing back uh, Russia has been drawing back from the dollar. Uh, people, I mean, you know, those countries that have reserves in dollar have reserves. They're putting them heavily in dollar uh, accounts, in dollar holdings, treasury bills, and so forth, and receiving very low interest rate. And they still they keep, they keep it there anyway. You know, Brazil, uh, ninety percent or so of its reserves are in yeah. are in dollar yeah. uh, holdings, uh, even though the interest rates are so low. Uh, even they're even paying them to keep yeah. their own dollars yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so uh, it is at the end of a cycle. And as you said, there is, um, I mean, change tends to come from places where we don't expect it. Ruptures are on, on, on the cards. This system, we might want to envision a, a, a negotiated pack uh, transition uh, for, towards a new architecture, but it's, it's likely, and I think we need to have that clearly in, in our focus, that it's likely that ruptures will occur from now on uh, and have been occurring. You know, you mentioned uh, you know, the Latin American cases, the South America, this has been going on, these uh, conflicts, uh, these new nationalisms, uh, even before the ethno-populist type uh, were there, you know, there was already ruptures going on. So I think um, what I find, um, uh, you may comment on that if you wish, but what I find important uh, is that this, the, the green, purple, red mm. alliance or the, the set of issues are being now put on the table in ways that they have never been put on the table before. Yeah? And whatever rupture occurs, at least that is now clearly on the table, thanks to you and others who have been bringing this all together uh, in, a, in an articulated, in a coherent way so that we can have a full picture yeah, of what some of these challenges are ahead of us. Um, be the, so. In any case, do you do you what do you have uh, in mind about these ruptures, which are really clearly on the table? We're not. Uh, I mean, you say the change might come from anywhere, but it, it, I, in my view, this is really one uh, of the possibilities now. Mm. Yeah, the type of delinking, the challenges yeah. that Samir Amin has spoken about. This will be. There will be several of these going on now. Yeah, please. Any, any wow, questions? big, big set of questions, Paris. So, okay, I, I'm going to take two, the monetary policy versus fiscal policy thing, and then the issue of ruptures, because they're both huge and, and very profound questions. So, you know, look, here's the thing. All these new liberals, they go on banging on about monetary policy. It's entirely political. When it comes to the crunch, they're very happy with fiscal, right? We saw that after the global financial crisis, where the IMF comes out and says, yeah, yeah, the United States should spend more, where they have a very large deficit, 11% of GDP immediately, which is directed towards saving finance. So all these fellows who tell you, oh, we can never have public spending, they don't mind when it's directed to them. <laughs> and that's what we've seen again after the pandemic. Suddenly there's money. All the same commentators and economic policy wonks and et cetera were saying you cannot do fiscal, you have to only do monetary, suddenly are okay with very, very large public spending, right? The first US uh, thing amounted to 11% of GDP, then the new one I think is going to be another 7% of GDP. Japan brings in a, th a thing for 22% of GDP, UK 10% of GDP, suddenly there's money. Suddenly it's okay to do fiscal policy, see, when they're at the crunch. And that's really because big capital has a very strong survival interest and they will do whatever it takes. And when they know that monetary policy is not going to deliver the goods, then they go for fiscal, it's no problem. In other words, this is not based on any principled or wrong economic position. It's a wrong economic position, but they, they just use that. That's just what they put out there because it suits them politically to do it that way. Uh, now that they need the fiscal policy, as I said, dominantly directed towards them, they will use that. But there's this other thing, the other aspect which all this time they have forgotten, which has to do, if you like, with this kind of prey-predator relationship. Remember that biological equation, the lotka volterra equation. Basically, if the prey eats too much, I mean, if the predator eats too much of the prey, then the predator starts dying off because you're cutting off your food supply. 
And this has happened to capitalism. It has global capital has eaten too much of its prey, which is the rest of humanity. And it is now in danger of starving itself. Therefore, it will, for its own survival, have to ensure some return of the prey. And I see some of that you know, in, in terms of those responses. Now, this is, of course, as I said, ascribing all the agency only to global capital because they have the power and, and so on and so forth. And we know that the, the issue is more complicated that you know, they may have the agency, but then other things happen and you know, other events and episodes and class forces and global forces intervene to restrict or alter their ability to have everything their own way. So I think, yes, that leads into your second question. We are heading for very, very, very uncertain and unstable times. Fractures already exist. I hate to be a little depressing, but I have to remind you that those fractures also can end up very badly. They can lead to wars. They already are leading to wars. And we, I think we're going to see many examples of that, the kind of thing that Joma was mentioning about ethno-nationalism that usually likes to end up in wars as a way of then you know, distracting everybody from all the other things that they can, simply cannot handle. And I think that's extremely likely in several of the countries that we, are, you know, we see today as uh, expressing that particular political position. So yes, there will be much more global instability. There is likely to be much more conflict including military conflict. Uh, those periods of military conflict in the past have also been periods when autonomous industrialization is possible only because all the rules are broken. You know, you can't have a WTO coming on your head because the whole thing is broken in a way and so on. So uh, it's a very complicated scenario. They, it's a lot of mess. Things are likely to get worse before they get better. But from that mess, I think you can also get some progress alternatives. Thank you, Jayatli. Um, we seem to be reaching uh, the end of our questions. Um, I think you've answered mine uh, brilliantly. I think uh, we are on the same page as far as that is concerned. Thank you. The, the, um, unless um, our colleagues inform me here that we have a new set of questions which uh, Actually, there have been some endorsements in our chat uh, box uh, about uh, your comments on the care economy, uh, the importance of bringing this into uh, uh, economic analysis, um, the, um, the case of India again, as, as far as uh, the, the substantial informal economy of care workers, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've talked about, uh, you've already touched upon these points mm -hmm. quite extensively uh, in your presentation and in the remarks uh, afterwards. So um, unless uh, you have anything further to add at this point, um, or our audience has any further comments, uh, we can uh, bring this to a close. Issa, do you have any further comments? Isa seems to be. Is Isa there? Not, off, no. See, oh, off, yeah. off. not, not, not yes. really. Yes, yes, really. Not Put really. your video on, Isa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I was just saying that uh, some of the points that Jomo made, I think we need to take up in our coming dialogue series because those are extremely relevant political points. And why I'm saying they are relevant and important is because, let's, let's face it, many of us uh, uh, are also confused as to what exactly is happening politically and what sense we can make of it, all right? And I think, therefore, it is important that we start a discourse on this issue of what you are witnessing. And I, I don't think it's time to shy away from it. Because, as you rightly pointed out, you and Jayati, that uh, both possibilities exist. Extreme militarism, wars and so on, but also progressive ruptures. Okay? So now, these are the tenants we're witnessing, and we need to discuss. And, 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 and where are we heading to? With the rise of populisms, 
which take on forms which we did not expect. We thought that things like fascism were over with the Second World War. All right. But now they're coming back in a more vicious fashion. So my suggestion is that in our coming uh, dialogue series, we should take, a, take up these issues and try to get experience from all parts of the continent or different continents as to what is going on in their own areas and countries. Uh, because let's, let's face it, on our own, we are at a loss. So how do we collectively develop a discourse mm. which would also be strengthening each other in our understanding and what possible courses are open to us in situations like this? Thank you. Thank you, Isa. Um, the, as far as the, 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 the forthcoming sessions, uh, we all always come back to this issue. In fact, we have touched upon it and we will have more sessions from the Americans coming up. Yeah. Um, the, and we can certainly plan uh, a session uh, perhaps towards the end uh, where we can bring in, uh, bring focus more systematically on the issue of the new uh, types of fascism that are coming up, cropping up uh, around the world. The, the next session, in fact, uh, the next two or three sessions will be in the Americas. Uh, we will have the, uh, the next one is uh, on uh, October 7th. Uh, we will have uh, Professor Michael Witter from the University of West Indies in Jamaica, who will speak on COVID-19 in the intensifying existential threat to the Caribbean. Yeah. We will also have, uh, so that's on, the, on October 7th, then we will have sessions on the, the USA. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Beverly Silver, who is with us today on our panelists, will be leading a session on the day after the elections, on, on the 4th of uh, November, uh, we'll be leading a session uh, together with Ricardo Jacobs on, uh, on that. We also have a session on Brazil, um, uh, which will be on uh, the type of fascism we have here now, um, and so forth. But we can, at the end, also plan for a, a session uh, which is comparative, which draws some general conclusions about these tendencies which are cropping up around the world. I would like to, to uh, bring this to a close. I would like to thank uh, Jayati for this brilliant session, uh, which has, as I said, uh, given us a breadth of, uh, of uh, issues and also depth on so many of them, um, and has put in a unique way everything that really is on the table in the 21st century. Thank you, Jayati, very much for this. Thank you so uh, much for the discussion. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks also to Lisa yeah. uh, for uh, being uh, always uh, himself and bringing the, the politics and the class issues uh, firmly on the table. Uh, I would also like to thank our supporting partners who I've, I've mentioned earlier, and especially to our logistics team with who works behind the scenes here, including Joseph, Matai, Frida Mazwi, Nabajit, uh, Asha, Rajiv, uh, Lalit, uh, Priyanka, Susan, and Julia Cabanco here in Brazil. Uh, there's a big team of, uh, of, that works behind the scenes who help us uh, make this uh, work effectively and efficiently. Thanks to all of you. Um, so the next session will be on, on, on October 7th. I think uh, today we have also given uh, our brother Sam Moyo a very nice present. I'm sure he's uh, very appreciative of this type of session that we have. Happy birthday to our brother Sam, mm -hmm. who is looking at us from above mm -hmm. uh, and taking care of us. Okay, so with those final words, thanks again, and we will bring this to a close. Thank you, Jayat. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.